the small community close to the residence of the Humistons in rural Washington awoke that morning to find itself going through a dream, the least of which was running red with blood. It was no average crime as their family lay dead in their home, ripped apart by the unbelievable. They're just still part of the community and I grieve for them and, and the extended families and the little survivor. And my heart goes out to the perpetrator. A 911 call from the suspect, 15-year-old, the content of his voice strained and trembling. All in a gush of words, he casually said to the dispatcher, he just shot my whole family and committed suicide too. Then came a haunting scenario of how his younger brother was the one who summoned up the bloodbath while he whispered from the bathroom that he had been hiding out of terror. He recounts his brother getting caught the previous night, gazing at pornography and being in line to be punished. The looming shadow he painted as the motive for his brother's deadly rage. But then another voice came along and blew his narrative to pieces. The insistent ring of his doorbell, which would not stop, rudely awakened a neighbor down the peaceful stretch of forest-lined road. Standing on his front stoop, shaking, blood running from her neck and hand, was the Humiston's 11-year-old daughter. Between sobs, she revealed what had really occurred. It was my brother. He shot them all. Sweetest children, um, so polite, homeschooled, and it's, just, it's unfathomable what just happened. This was how the police, piece by piece, wove together a story layer by layer, unwinding the tale of horror that had unfolded during the pre-dawn chill of those morning hours. The young girl was sleeping in her room when the crack of gunshots tore through the air. She managed to peek through her door and saw her father lying in the hallway, blood spilling from his head. Her brother stood over him, blood already dotting his clothes, while her heart pounded between shock and terror as she watched him move into her room, gun in hand. Her sister had been the first to run from the room out into the hall, where she was caught by a bullet that dropped her to the floor. She sat there, paralyzed in terror, as her brother, cool and calculating, directed the gun at her. Instinctively, she threw up her hands and felt excruciating pain as bullets ripped into her neck and hand. She slumped to the floor, finding the strength to feign death, lying without moving, holding her breath as he bent over her to determine if she still breathed. When the time came, he crossed out of the room to make his staged call to the police. She scrambled frantically to the fire window, desperate, battered, and bleeding, out into the dark morning, her each step taking her closer to salvation. Later, in the cold light of hospital and police interrogation, she would say so much more than the details of the massacre. She described how her brother had been the only one with access to their father's gun, having learned the combination to the lock box that held the silver Glock. And yes, he had been in trouble at school, failing grades, stifled ambitions. The portrait of her brother that emerged wasn't one of an unknown monster, but rather a boy festering in silence until he reached his breaking point. Soon, court proceedings began, and he scrambled as the boy's attorneys did to protect his image. They contended that this boy, this quiet, troubled teenager, had been good-hearted, a kind son, and a friendly presence in the community. They even brought in letters from friends, and his attorney Amy Parker assured the judge that her client was a positive contributor to his community, a boy with pro-social interests. Yet, the court had one inescapable fact. The teenager was looking at five counts of aggravated first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder staring him in the face, with each crime weighted with a domestic violence heft. Prosecutors fought. This was not a case for juvenile detention. This boy, they argued, needed to face adult court for the gravity of his crimes. Yet there was still darkness in the shadows. The girl, in the grandmother's care now, had more than physical scars but was psychically scarred too. 
and her innocence was taken away by what would become lifelong memories. And the house, the court-ordered seal, impregnated and preserved a tomb of family secrets, a monument to one night that tore a family asunder. A faint hint of violence hovered over them, bracketed by silent, unasked questions which courts or counselors would never fully answer. And as the case drew the attention of the media and whispers circulated through the town, one chilling fact was held constant. Whatever the court decided, the horror loosed that morning could never be undone. The court proceedings dragged on and on, peeling back the layers of a boy once seen as normal, now shadowed by something darker, unexplainable. Psychologists, called by both the defense and the prosecution, offered opposing interpretations of his mind as each side fought to sway the court's perception of him. Dr. Lyman, a psychologist for the defense, told of adolescent brain development, how teenagers are more apt to make impulsive decisions under emotional stress. She cited recent studies, emphasizing he most likely had acted upon an overwhelming, powerful urge driven by his fear of consequences by his failures at school and his recent array of isolation. But the prosecution's expert, Dr. Sandoval, painted a very different picture of him, a calculated young man who deceived his family knowingly, pretending normalcy while seething with resentment. The staged scene and the attempt to deceive first responders, Sandoval said, speaks to a mind that, if not fully developed, is certainly capable of cold calculation. Meanwhile, the girl's young surviving granddaughter was left in the care of her grandmother, who sought to rehabilitate her from the horror she'd seen. In therapy, she drew somber and chaotic pictures family figures lying in pools of red crayon, a faceless brother with his back to the viewer. Her therapist documented the way she had grown quiet, jerking at the slightest sudden sounds, and waking up screaming in terror. To her, the nightmare was replayed every night, often accompanied by the sound of her brother's footsteps coming closer, echoing down the hall, his face as cold and expressionless as the weapon he'd used. With the trial nearing its climax, Judge Richardson was confronted with an impossible decision. Whether the boy, who had shown no remorse and had allegedly contrived the scene, should face adult consequences, or was he yet a child, a boy lost in the torrent of his own emotions, who might one day be rehabilitated? The usually circumstantially filled courtroom, with pressmen and quizzical townspeople, finally showed up in court on the last day, when Judge Richardson would give her verdict. She started first by acknowledging the terrible tragedy, her voice steady yet solemn. We are dealing with a boy who has committed a horrific crime, a crime which has devastated a family and scarred an entire community. She paused, glancing at the young girl's face, her wide, haunted eyes fixed on the judge's every word. And yet, this court recognizes that at 15, he remains a child. He announced that he would be sentenced as a juvenile, but with the strictest confinement possible by law. He would serve time in prison until he was 25 years old. After that, a parole board would review his case. The courtroom erupted in murmurs and gasps, and some of the audience members looked downright outraged where others looked relieved. Reporters clustered outside the courthouse, all competing for one scoop from this family and community regarding reactions. She protected her granddaughter from the cameras, pulling her tight as her eyes welled up with tears, but with a tinge of determination. She would not answer any of their questions, but instead silently pushed the girl through the flashing cameras, holding onto her hands so tightly as they disappeared into the crowd. Months passed by. Consigned to the juvenile detention center, the boy kept mostly to himself. Sometimes, letters would come from his grandmother in lines that offered tender words of encouragement and updates of his sister's slow, yet sure, healing. Sometimes, the letters were cold, succinct reminders of his pain. 
She never brought with her his sister to visit, yet the face of his sister haunted him, haunted his nightmares, standing tiny at the far end of a long hallway and staring back at him with blood and horror she would never be free of. The Humiston house became a silent landmark of grief in the town, boarded up with weeds creeping up through the once well-kept lawn. Sealed under the judge's orders, guarded largely by police, the home was a monument to a family destroyed by an act no one could fully comprehend. It was as if the house itself was holding its breath, waiting for that day when it would be released from the memories clinging to its wall. And every now and then, townspeople passing by swore they still could hear the faintest echoes of footsteps down darkened halls, reminding them of that night when everything in the Humiston home fell silent, too silent forever. What do you think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this video informative, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for more true crime stories and case updates. We'll keep you posted as the legal proceedings continue. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there.